Hi guys, Drea from Aloha Plant Life here and welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to be giving you a care guide for Syngonium, one of my favorite types of plants. They're great plants for beginners in my opinion. I really don't think they're that difficult to take care of, but I have heard people say that they have had some struggles, so I decided to put this care guide together for you today. So to start off with, Syngonium are aeroids and the scientific name of the most common variety that you're going to see in your local plant stores is Syngonium podophyllum, such as my Glogo which I have here. And the common name for these plants is arrowhead vine, called that because the leaves are this little arrowhead type shape. However, as these plants mature, these leaves actually become three part lobed leaves. It does take quite a while for the plant to get to that point. So unless you're buying a very, very already mature plant, you're gonna see this shape of leaf for quite some time on your syngoniums. Now, as far as growth pattern goes for these plants, it is, as I said, commonly called an arrowhead vine because it is a vining plant. This plant is a relatively immature plant. It is starting to get some nodes going on. It's really, they're really high up in the center of this. There's not gonna be a good way for me to get up in there to show you, but they are starting to get some nodes coming out. So eventually here in the next, probably over the course of the next year, this will start to to look more like a vining plant. However, you can keep them trimmed back to this bushy appearance relatively easily, and I honestly prefer them that way, so that is what I will do with all of my Syngonium. But if you don't want to keep them trimmed back to that bushy appearance, you can let them vine and trail. I will let you know though, for whatever reason, Syngoniums tend to have a more leggy appearance than most of your vining plants, regardless of lighting. So normally when I talk about your vining plants getting leggy, it's usually because they're not getting enough light. Syngonium just naturally have longer spaces in between the nodes, and I think it makes them look a little bit weirder and a little bit lankier, which is why I don't like to let them trail. However, you could also let them grow up a pole, up a trellis, they attach pretty easily to almost anything. So. Those are other options for you. And when I say they attach pretty easily to almost anything, I mean almost anything. So be mindful what you have it next to because it might try to attach to anything it can touch. Now there are lots of different varieties, but we're gonna focus primarily on those podophyllums that I mentioned today. But within the podophyllums, there are other, I guess you call it a series of plants. And honestly, you guys, some of these things are just names that growers come up with so that they can patent certain things and whatnot, but there is what is known as an illusion series. And I do think that the most recent Syngonium I got that I showed you, and I think it was my most recent plant haul video, I really do think this is some type of illusion. And you can see this one's got that little kind of pinkish vine going down the middle, which a lot of the illusion varieties have that different colored veining in the middle. And the illusion series of plants are supposedly ones that are going to stay more compact and bushy. Now only time will tell because obviously this was just a little baby one when I bought it, but if you do want one that is gonna stay more small, more compact and more of that bushy appearance without you having to do as much trimming, then look for one of the illusion series. So there's like a berry illusion, a bob illusion. And honestly, I really have a hard time telling the difference between a lot of them, but all of them are very pretty. So that's something to keep in mind when you're shopping for Syngonium. So let's say you've gone out and you bought yourself a cute little Syngonium like this, or like my logo, you get it home now, how do you take care of it? So let's start off with lighting, because I've said it before and I'll say it again, I think water and lighting are the two things that if you don't get it right, things go wrong. And then you misinterpret what's going wrong, and if you had just gotten the water and lighting right in the first place, maybe nothing would have gone wrong. So that's where we're gonna start. So light. They do not want direct light. Do not get those leaves into direct light. They can burn very easily. They also dry up very easily. So you wanna make sure it's in direct light. And even though it's indirect light, I find that they don't really even want bright indirect light. They want more of a medium indirect light to almost a lower light situation. So. I do have my white butterfly syngonium over here that's making me a little bit nervous. I've told you guys before, this plant lives in my office and it, this is its first time out of this room since being put in my office because it did have a case of thrips. And so I checked every inch of this plant. I do not think it has any bugs anymore, but it's still making me a little bit nervous having it out here. But I wanted to bring it out to show you guys because it just is so beautiful, first of all, and it is my biggest syngonium that I have and it is living in a north facing window. So they are low light tolerant 
and this plant has done wonderfully in that window. Now, the Glogo, on the other hand, is living in a room closest to a southern facing window, but it is quite a bit back, six to seven feet back from that window, and it's doing fine as well, but that is a lot less light that it's getting that far back from that southern window, and it's getting no direct light whatsoever. Now, if you're not sure how to tell if your Syngonium is getting too much light or too little light, let's start with too little light. These plants really like to stretch towards the light, and let me see if I can get this one angled so that you can see. So I don't know if you can see here, but this plant is kind of all kind of coming this direction. And so it was on a shelf and I hadn't rotated it in a while. So it all started stretching towards the light. So that right there tells me that I probably could have it closer to that window and it would be fine because it's stretching so much towards that light. I did finally just rotate it yesterday. So it's starting to straighten back out. But that's another thing you wanna keep in mind because these plants, very similar to the Monstera here, they will reach for the light all the time. So make sure whenever you're watering them, you're rotating them a quarter turn so that they don't start to look too lopsided. But if they are stretching just right away every time you rotate them, that's a good sign that they probably want a little bit more light than what they're getting. Now, as far as too much light goes, what happens when they're getting too much light? Well, if they're getting direct light, you will get leaf burn, but if you're sure that they're not getting direct light on them, but it's just too bright regardless, those leaves will typically start to become pale and crispy and almost paper-like. So I do have an example of a leaf here that this is actually the result of what happens if you don't water it quickly enough, but the same thing happens to the leaf if it gets too much light. So if you know for sure that your plant's not thirsty and you're starting to get paler leaves that are almost turning totally yellow, and if you can hear that, are crispy and turning almost paper-like, that's a good sign that it's getting too much light and you probably wanna try pulling it back from the window a bit or moving it to a less bright location. Now, as I said, this was actually the result of me waiting too long to water it. I was bad. So if you wait too long to water your plant, the good thing is this is a very vocal plant when it comes to if it's thirsty. So the first thing you're gonna see is drooping. And sometimes that drooping might only happen on the lower leaves. That still means it's thirsty. So don't wait for the upper leaves to also droop before you go and water it. If any part of that plant is starting to droop, it's thirsty, it wants water. And if you go too long after that point, the lower leaves will start to yellow, crisp up and die. And that's what happened here. But in general, they do not want to dry all the way out between waterings, but they also do not like to have wet feet. These plants are highly prone to root rot, so you want to make sure you are letting them dry out a bit between waterings, just not all the way. I typically try to go until it's about halfway dry, and once again, I look and wait and see if I'm seeing drooping going on. If I'm seeing drooping and we're almost halfway dry, then I'm going to definitely go in there and give it a nice deep watering. But sometimes I might go a little bit longer than that, maybe like three quarters of the way dry, but I definitely wouldn't go any more than three quarters of the way dry in that pot before watering these plants again. And definitely the second you see any signs of drooping, hit it with that watering can, getting a nice deep soak in there. Now, as I said, they do not like to have wet feet. So soil with these plants is very important to get right. You need a very well draining soil. However, unlike a lot of other aeroids, such as the Monstera here, these plants are not epiphytic. And what that means is, unlike the Monstera here that likes to grow on the side of a tree and it gets a lot of its nutrients and moisture from the air around it versus from the soil below it, these plants rely more on the soil to get their nutrients and their water. So they don't need as airy of a mixture as a Monstera would, but they still need that extra drainage. So what I do for these plants is anywhere from a two thirds to one third ratio, two thirds of premium potting soil to one third of extra drainage such as pumice or perlite, or even all the way up to three quarters premium potting soil to one quarter extra drainage. Now, if you are naturally prone to overwatering, I would go the two thirds to one thirds route because that's a little bit more extra drainage that's gonna help you out if you're heavy handed with that watering can. Now, as far as temperature goes, these cute little plants are from a tropical jungle environment. So they do prefer it more on the warm side, but as long as you're keeping your house anywhere between 60 to 80 degrees, they're gonna be fine. These plants though, do not let them get down below 50 degrees. They will not do well. And that goes for most of your tropical house plants. If I'm being honest, 50 degrees is kind of that danger, danger red line zone for any of of these types of plants. And as with all house plants, try to avoid any kind of drafts from your air vents. You don't want direct heat drafts blowing on this. You don't want direct AC drafts blowing on this. So keep that in mind when you're choosing where to place them. And as far as humidity goes, 
These plants, honestly, I think are fine with almost any level of humidity. Now, as I have said before, all plants I feel like would love to have higher humidity. I think every plant, unless it's like a desert cacti type plant or succulent, would prefer like 60% or higher humidity. It would really be like their like dream situation. But these plants are gonna do okay with your basic humidity. If you've got 40 to 50% humidity in your home, you're gonna be okay. But mine did fine all throughout the winter without the help of a humidifier or anything like that. And we got down to like, I think the lowest was 26% humidity at one point in this house. But most of the time it was somewhere between like 30 and 35 in the winter. And they didn't get any crispy leaves or you know, drying out situations or anything like that. So they will do well pretty much in any type of humidity in my experience. So fertilizing, let's talk about fertilizing. I do the same thing with these plants as I do with my other house plants. As long as they're growing, I fertilize them once a month. For these specific types of plants, the Syngonium here, I find that a balanced fertilizer, liquid fertilizer or other is kind of the best way to go. And what do I mean by balanced? You know, you guys, I haven't really talked in depth a lot about fertilizers before. So when I say balanced, I'm talking about like a liquid fertilizer that say a 999, for example, that's the balanced liquid fertilizer that I use. So what does 999 mean? So those numbers coincide with N, P, and K. And what does N, P, K mean? N, P, and K are just the scientific symbols for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So all those three numbers mean is how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is in that liquid fertilizer in relation to the amount of water in that fertilizer. So a balanced fertilizer is gonna be the same number no matter what it may be, 999, 10, 10, 10, 11, 11, 11. That just means it's equal parts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium compared to the amount of water in there. Now, the higher those numbers are, that just means the less water is in that bottle and the more of those ingredients is in that bottle. That's all that means. So if we say balance, we just mean it should be the same number for each of those ingredients, if you will. And mine did grow throughout the winter as well, so I kept giving them fertilizer at least once a month throughout the winter, and that has worked very well for me. Obviously, they're looking very cool, beautiful, and happy, but the one thing that might make them unhappy is pests. So let's go ahead and get that annoying one out of the way. So you have heard me talk about the thrip issue that I had on this beautiful white butterfly syngonium, and just, just let's look at this for a second. So beautiful, I don't even know if you can hear me because it might be blocking the microphone, but these beautiful leaves come in kind of a more variegated green and then they turn into this almost white color. You can see here at the top, hence why I'm guessing it's called a white butterfly. And as they move, they kind of look like they're fluttering and it's just a very, very gorgeous plant. Absolutely love it. Definitely super heavy since I repotted it a couple months ago, but this plant did have thrips and I, believe I discussed this in that last plant haul video that that year when I went in search of some more Syngonium, every single store I went to, every single Syngonium had thrip on them. It was crazy. And that is the only pest I saw on them that entire time that I was shopping for more. I honestly have had no issues on the Glogo and I have had no issues. We're done acclimating now, this little guy no pest issues on this one. And I have heard a lot of other people say that thrip has been one of the biggest problems they've had on their syngoniums, but I do know people who have had spider mites on them. The nice thing about thrips, if you can actually say there's a nice thing about thrips, but it's useful that you can actually see them even when they're larva with your naked eye, unlike spider mites. And like I said, I'm pretty sure they're all gone now, but another good way to know that you have thrips is to spot thrift damage. So let me see if I can get her lifted up enough here for you to see what thrip damage looks like on some of these older leaves. So if you can see there, those brown spots on the tips of the leaves, and then there's some kind of higher up the leaves on some of these, you can see there's like a hole in some of them. Those are signs of thrip damage. So basically what thrips do is they go and they suck on your plant and the areas that they suck on, they pull out all the nutrients and everything that they need. And now you're left with these weird little brown spots. So that's what that is. So if you see that, the first thing I would do is check those leaves top and bottom because usually they're hiding on the bottom to see if you have a pest issue. I have never, once again, had any kind of brown spots or anything on the Glogo over here and it survived the whole winter in my house with no brown tips or anything like that. So if you see that, I would not jump to the conclusion of, oh, I don't have enough humidity, 
oh, I haven't been watering it enough. For me, that is 100% a sign. Oh my gosh, there might be a pest issue. So definitely look for that first. And just always in general, you guys, be checking your plants every time you water them thoroughly, top and bottom of the leaves to see if there's any pests because the sooner you catch it, the easier it is to get rid of them. So let's talk about repotting this. As I mentioned, I did just recently repot the white butterfly. So for Syngonium, I usually check them once a year to see if they need to be repotted, but I wait to repot them until they're pretty significantly root bound. As I mentioned before, they are pretty prone to root rot if you overwater, if they're sitting in soggy soil and have wet feet. And a good way to avoid that is to make sure that you're pretty root bound, a lot of roots before you move it up one pot size and only move it up one pot size when you go to repot it because now you've got a lot of roots You've got only about an inch or so of soil, new soil around those roots. And that's just enough for the roots to be like, yay, more soil, more water, but not keep them too wet. And as usual, when repotting, I don't mess with their roots. I don't go in there trying to untangle anything. I just brush off any loose soil that's at the top. If there is any kind of loose soil at the bottom, I just kind of brush that off. I don't go pulling or tugging at the roots and that has done well for me. Obviously very happy after the repot here. And the last thing I wanna talk about is propagating. So I have not actually propagated any of mine yet because they haven't really grown out enough for me to be able to do so. But propagation on these is exactly like philodendron propagation or monstera propagation. And I do have a video that I recently did on philodendron propagation, which I'll link below for you as well. But same concept applies here because it is technically a vining plant. So you're going to have to wait till it gets to kind of a vining stage because you're gonna need a node. So you're just gonna go in, you're gonna find a node, you're gonna cut below that node. And then the easiest way, in my opinion, to go about this is gonna be the same way as the philodendron because, I mean, these plants are related. Philodendron and syngonium are related. So water is the easiest way, in my opinion, to propagate a philodendron. I think the same thing here. You're just gonna cut below that node, pop it into some water, wait till it gets some roots, and then you're gonna move it over to your well-draining soil mix. Now, similar to your philodendron, these can live in water. So be careful how long you're leaving them in the water. You only wanna leave them in there till they've got about two inches worth of roots. Then you want to move them over to that soil. If you wait too long, they might not ever acclimate fully to the soil. But you can take that same cutting and put it directly into soil if you want to. I just think there's higher risk of it rotting in that situation and they just root so easily in water. Why not? But to each their own, either way will work. And just like with those philodendron or any other vining plant, if you only propagate one node, one cutting, it's only gonna ever be one vine. So if you want a nice full propagation, when you're propagating the plant, you're gonna need to take several cuttings, let them root up, and then plant them together in your new pot when you move it to soil. It really is, in my opinion, a very easy to care for plant. I think it's a great plant for beginners. I think they're super beautiful plants. And I will say, as far as colors go and varieties, it's pretty limited to greenish varieties. So like all of these are greenish varieties, even though this one does have that pink ish vein down the middle. But these are variegated green, a little bit of white in them varieties. And then on the flip side of that, you have some stronger variegated varieties. They're gonna have like a lot more white and dark green, like an albo one. And then on the other side of that, you have all the pink ones. And there's just different types, pink splash, the confetti ones. And those are all gonna be combinations of like green and pink or green, pink and white. And that's kind of the majority of your syngoniums. You don't really necessarily see a ton of other color varieties. There is one that is kind of more of a dark green on front with a red on back called a something Cardi Road. I'll flash it on screen for you. I'm having a little bit of a blank out on that one. That one is, is a little bit more unique. I really do like the look of that one as well. But yeah, other than that, it's just really a lot of variations on greens and whites and pinks and whatnot. But I think they're absolutely gorgeous. And let me know what you think. Do you own any Sigonium? Have you found them easy? Comment down below and let us know. I honestly really do enjoy reading all of your guys' comments and answering your questions. And I try to answer everybody. So if I have somehow missed anybody, I do apologize. It was not intentional but it is kind of a highlight of my first few hours after posting videos is to get to sit and see what all of you guys have to say about them. So thank you for doing that. And if you guys have not yet hit that like and or subscribe button down below, please do so. And I look forward to seeing you again next time. Aloha.